Hi everyone, good morning and thanks for attending PyTorch Meetup. This is our third meetup this year. Uh, we are collaborating with uh, Meta and the, the Linux Foundation. And uh, uh, in this particular meetup, we are collaborating with Intel as well. I want to thank uh, uh, Benjamin, Susan, Kevin, and uh, Jen, Kali, and Helen for uh, helping us to bring this event together. Uh, we had a previous meetup uh, on how to contribute to PyTorch, and we are having PyTorch Jacobon that is going on right now. I hope you have registered for that event. Uh, we will be having question and answer section in the chat. We, you can ask your question in the chat, and you're encouraged to participate uh, by asking questions, sharing your insights, and engaging with other attendees. Um, we have speakers from Intel Corporation. Um, uh, thank you, Kevin, for becoming the speaker for our event. Kevin is the AI Software Solutions Engineer at Intel Corporation. Uh, he holds a PhD in Engineering and Applied Science with a focus on medical image analysis. Uh, thank you, uh, Kevin, for being the speaker. Uh, over to you now. Uh, great. Thanks, Deborah. Um... Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here. Uh, thanks so much for having me here. Uh, as Deborah mentioned, my name is Kevin. I am an AI software solutions engineer at Intel. I work adjacent to the PyTorch development team, also here at Intel, where my job is essentially to help customers and uh, the general developer community optimize their AI workloads on Intel hardware, which of course uh, brings us to today's talk, uh, accelerate your deep learning workloads using Intel optimizations for PyTorch. So here's an agenda for uh, today's talk. I'm going to give an overview of what Intel optimization for PyTorch is. Uh, then I'll go over how to install it. It's not anything crazy. Um, I'll give an intro into the types of optimizations we incorporated and how, uh, we, can, how we can apply them. And then I'll give a brief overview of uh, the fourth gen Intel Xeon scalable processor. I'm not really gonna go into depth since this isn't really going to be a hardware talk, but I think it's good to see uh, after hearing about our optimizations where we've landed today in our efforts toward optimizing PyTorch. And then if there's still time at the end, I'll do a, a simple demo, or I'll just leave a, a couple links if you want to try them out yourself. Um, first off, uh, what is the uh, Intel optimization for PyTorch? I think that more than a negligible amount of people uh, are surprised whenever I tell them that Intel actually has a fairly lengthy history uh, in the deep learning space. In fact, we have uh, dedicated developer teams for both PyTorch and TensorFlow. Uh, but since this is talk about PyTorch, uh, we contribute to PyTorch from two passes directly upstream and uh, parallel as an extension. So uh, Intel engineers have been continuously working with the PyTorch open source community alongside the PyTorch dev team at Meta to get uh, PyTorch to run faster on Intel CPUs. And uh, we contribute a lot of these efforts directly to PyTorch upstream, which I'm calling uh, stock PyTorch, meaning off the shelf official PyTorch, basically the one uh, you're likely thinking of when I say PyTorch. So when you install PyTorch from the main PyTorch channel, uh, the CPU installation actually comes with uh, Intel optimizations already. So from a user standpoint, your PyTorch installation already contains a lot of the upstream Intel optimizations. So if you have an Intel CPU, whether on your local computer or if you're using a server or a cloud computing platform, you um, already likely are making use of these optimizations for any operations being loaded on uh, onto the CPU, of course, uh, and provided it has the uh, proper instruction sets, which most of our modern uh, CPUs do. And uh, just to put it out there, uh, there are a lot of uh, servers out there um, that do, or compute instances that do have um, Intel hardware, specifically the Xeon scalable processor, which are powerful data center CPUs. So you can make use of um, that today if you wanted to. Uh, however, there are uh, there may be instances where optimizations cannot be integrated upstream to PyTorch or just have not yet been up, uh, upstream. For that, we have this open source extension uh, called the Intel extension for PyTorch or IPEX for short. And this mainly serves as a staging area with the latest optimizations to help users to achieve maximized deep learning inference and training performance on Intel CPUs. Uh, uh, most of the optimizations in the extension will uh, be included in future stock PyTorch releases eventually. And um, 
these two installations, that's the stock PyTorch plus the extension are what we call the Intel optimization for PyTorch. So here's a uh, timeline of Intel's journey working closely with the meta team and the open source community. So as you know, um, Intel is historically a hardware company. So it makes sense that as we release new hardware, there are newer potential features that can be taken advantage of by software. Uh, as you can see, Intel has made uh, significant contributions to PyTorch upstream. Our timeline uh, showcases both our past contributions to the upstream side and Intel's advancements um, in data center CPU hardware. So the upper uh, swim lane represents Intel's hardware advancements, including um, advanced vector extensions that accelerate dot product computation for various data types, such as bflow 16 and int 8. And as you know, uh, dot product computation is a highly compute intensive um, operation in deep learning workloads. And we anticipate further uh, hardware advancements in the next generations of uh, Intel CPU and GPU. And on the bottom swim lane, um, this represents our contributions to PyTorch. These are the uh, upstream contributions. Our goal is to ensure that um, users can not only benefit from these hardware features, but also experience ease of use in obtaining these optimizations. And to achieve this, we have integrated uh, the one DNN library, which is our one API deep neural network library to uh, accelerate convolution uh, and matrix operations, just general deep learning operations. Um, additionally, we have uh, directly added optimizations to PyTorch for memory uh, intensive operations as well. And as I mentioned in the slide before, alongside uh, our upstream contributions, which we showcase here, we also release in parallel uh, IPEX. And the main benefit is that um, IPEX users will be able to get up-to-date features and optimizations on the latest Intel hardware in a uh, relatively agile and fast manner that keeps up to date with the latest Intel hardware. Um, okay, so here's a big picture of how uh, the different layers fit together. At the very bottom layer, Intel's optimizations for PyTorch uh, aims to improve the performance of PyTorch on Intel Xeon servers and uh, discrete graphics cards. And on top of that hardware, um, we have highly optimized performance libraries for deep learning uh, and distributed training, 1DNN, 1CCL. I mentioned 1DNN on the previous slide, which is our, um, uh, which is used to optimize deep learning specific operations. 1CCL is the 1API collective communications library, and it's a library for optimized uh, distributed training across multiple nodes. And these libraries uh, work with all Intel platforms, including CPU and GPU. Now on top of these uh, high performance libraries is where our optimizations in uh, PyTorch upstream and IPEX sit. Uh, and then we make sure that those optimizations are enabled in ecosystem projects like uh, Torch Vision and Hugging Face, Deep Speed, et cetera. Uh, we also uh, have integrated IPEX into Torch Serve so that uh, PyTorch users can get good performance out of the box when deploying their production, uh, then deploying their models in a production environment. And uh, usually most of these optimizations get picked up by default by the ecosystem projects, but sometimes we uh, may have to enable and fine tune using our extension or general optimizations for specific use cases. Uh, and now going forward in this presentation, I'm going to be focusing more on IPEX just because uh, I feel it wouldn't be too fruitful just to discuss, you know, Torch APIs that automatically have Intel hardware optimizations. It's probably more interesting to see um, what how how optimizations can be added to further uh, squeeze out performance. Um, so here's a screenshot directly from the IPEX documentation. You know, the Git uh, the GitHub.io. Um, you can see we actually have two versions: the CPU version which is uh, probably a more mature version and designed to run on Intel CPU and the XPU version, which is designed to run on Intel GPU, uh, Intel GPU uh, with support for CPU as well. And you can see that the uh, CPU version is actually up to date with the latest PyTorch release, or uh, at least very closely up to date with it, while the XPU version is behind like a release or two. So as I've been saying, IPEX, um, 
is a plugin developed on the basis of PyTorch with the purpose of uh, further improving performance on Intel hardware. Uh, and we have open source PyTorch, uh, we've open sourced IPAX on GitHub and you can uh, browse it at will in its entirety. And at the same time, you're welcome to contribute code to IPEX as well, because ultimately we want this to be a developer enhancing experience as opposed to um, just an additional package that you'll have to learn. The picture here on the right um, is a structural diagram of this plugin. Uh, so first off, the boxes that are shaded in blue are the IPEX extended components on top of the PyTorch components. Uh, which are the white blocks. And the different shades of blue indicate GPU versus CPU versions or uh, ones that operate um, the same in both. Uh, PyTorch provides two computing uh, modes. One is called eager mode uh, or imperative mode. Uh, in this mode, PyTorch um, will only focus on the currently calculated operator. It has no sort of big picture concepts of the overall structure of the model. And this is advantageous for, um, for the development and debugging of models because we can clearly know uh, which operators are running and we can see uh, whether the results are correct or not. But conversely, uh, this is not an advantage from a deployment point of view. When you deploy a model, uh, we are more concerned about performance and we hope that the calculation of the model uh, can be faster and more interesting. Or, um, and in response to this, uh, PyTorch provides a uh, graph mode. Uh, before the actual operation, what happens is PyTorch will detect the overall structure of the model and use the model uh, uh, and use methods such as operator fusion and constant folding to modify and merge this model structure um, to a certain extent so, so as to reduce the time loss caused by, let's say, invalid uh, operations and hopefully improve performance. And IPEX actually supports uh, both of these modes of operation. Uh, we've optimized some operators themselves using PyTorch's built-in operator uh, registration and distribution mechanism for customization, um, and also have a more comprehensive combination of operator fusions. So uh, IPEX will actually um, detect the instruction set architecture of the current Intel hardware during runtime and then use the most suitable operator for the current hardware um, architecture for calculation. So for, if, so for example, if the plugin detects that the current hardware supports um, the AVX 512 instruction set, it will use the operator um, implementation method that supports AVX 512 to perform operations. Um, and this will hopefully improve the efficiency of computing resources as much as possible. Uh, you'll see here on the one API level, on the one hand, we directly vectorize and optimize the built-in uh, A10 operators. On the other hand, we also use um, Intel's high performance one API libraries, which um, as I mentioned before, specifically designed to accelerate deep learning operations. Um, and all this is either built um, on Sickle and level zero runtime for GPU or OpenMP thread runtime for CPU. So um, how do we actually get IPEX and get the fully optimized PyTorch? So it's actually quite simple. Um, uh, for CPU, if you want to install a pre-built wheel file using pip, you can just pip install uh, Intel extension for PyTorch, so long as you already have um, Torch installed. If you want to compile from source, on the other hand, we actually include a shell script with a set of instructions on the documentation page uh, for you to do that. There are um, a couple of things that you have to take into consideration. So obviously there are system requirements, but also it's actually uh, quite important that you have the same PyTorch version as the IPEX that you're installing. Because it's an extension, um, it's designed just to plug into your existing PyTorch installation. Uh, it doesn't operate on its own. So if you have an incompatible version, uh, which is really just any Torch that isn't the same version as IPEX, uh, you'll get thrown an error. Uh, so luckily, as I showed you before, the CPU version um, is released at a relatively similar cadence as the master PyTorch branch. So if you install the latest versions, most likely you'll be fine. But you know, if you didn't install the latest versions or you have an older version, it's, it's not too hard just to specify um, what version of IPEX you want to just make sure that it matches your Torch version. 
And for XPU, it's about the same, but it is a tad bit different. As you'll see on the version mapping table, version is still very important, but they need to be patched in some way. Documentation themselves, along with uh, the compile from source shell script, will go over all those details. But like the CPU version, you can just install um, using the pre-built wheel files and avoid any sort of headaches. And since the base PyTorch needed, uh, needs a patch, it's recommended that you also install the uh, pre-built wheel files for Torch as well. This is for XPU. For CPU, you can just install the Torch from you know, the, how you normally would install PyTorch. And uh, for hardware requirements, you'll need a supported Intel GPU to make use of the GPU functions. And uh, you'll, you'll actually also need the one API base toolkit installed and activated in order to use it. So it's a little bit of an extra step um, that you didn't need with the CPU version, but it'll allow you to use Intel GPU to its full capacity. And hopefully it's not too much of, a, of an overhaul. And alternatively, there's also uh, the Intel AI toolkit. It's also free. And if you install it, uh, it comes with kind of environments. Um, and the base toolkit that I mentioned before. And uh, two of those kind of environments will either be the IPEX CPU or the IPEX GPU. And you can just clone those environments and get started right away. Uh, but of course, uh, the problem is the AI kit comes with all these other optimized versions of popular frameworks as well. So it might be a bit of, of a cumbersome option for personal use. But if you had, um, for example, a workstation or a server, uh, it may be easier just to install the kit and get all Intel optimized AI offerings. Um, and I know this is something that uh, a lot of our high compute center customers like to do, but um, again, for personal use, you probably don't need all these different uh, frameworks. So you can just install IPEX separately. So I've been talking about um, optimizations for a while now. It's probably a good time to just show you a snapshot of the type of performance uh, gain that you can hope to achieve. Uh, now, of course, it, it'll depend on your specific workload. It'll depend on your specific hardware. So your mileage will vary. But just as a taste, here's a snapshot of performance boost of um, for FP32 inference and in A inference using Intel extension for PyTorch. And what these numbers are depicting um, is the factor of speed up. So the higher, the better. And in this context, like say, for example, 1x would mean no speed up, and then 2x would mean twice speed up, et cetera. Um, the orange horizontal line is the average speed up across these popular models. And you can see um, for FP32 inference, we're getting up to 1.7x gain, which is about 70% speed up. Um, for int 8, we are getting up to around 2.7x gain, which is well over twice uh, as fast, almost three times as fast as the stock PyTorch. Um, and over the course of a large data set, this can be, this can be pretty substantial, especially in deployment. Um, now, how are we actually achieving these gains? Uh, to dive a little bit deeper into our optimizations, you can think of our optimizations in the form of three pillars, um, operator, graph, and runtime optimizations. For operator optimizations, we have things like uh, vectorization in order to efficiently use computing resources on CPU in a single calculation um, to minimize time from invalid calculations that I had mentioned earlier. Uh, parallelization in order to uh, process multiple calculations simultaneously. Um, it's also the usage of lower uh, precision data types uh, to reduce memory usage and increase uh, computational speed. Uh, and of course, uh, the memory layout, how the data is stored can also um, affect performance. And for graph optimization, um, we employ constant folding uh, to reduce operations between operators. Uh, as well as uh, we also develop ways of fusing um, combinations of, uh, of, um, of common operators in order to speed things up. And for runtime optimizations, um, we have things like thread affinity, uh, multi-stream, uh, memory buffering pool and whatnot. Uh, basically runtime extensions can reduce time loss caused by communications between, um, between cores by binding uh, computing threads two specific physical cores. And uh, for GPU, there are runtime options that you can uh, configure for debugging um, or execution. And then we also provide what we call launcher script. And I'll go over that uh, in the next few slides. So uh, now I just wanna dive uh, 
Now, um, I want to dive uh, deeper into a few of the more prevalent optimizations, but before I do that, I wanted to stop here and just sort of discuss at a practical level uh, how we can achieve, um, how, how we can get started to achieve these sort of um, performance boosts with applying these optimizations that IPEX has to offer. Um, so, I mean, luckily, uh, while there are a lot of optimizations that our engineers have been painstakingly developing, continuing to develop and refine. And while there are a lot of different ways to tune performance, uh, again, that I'll be going over in the upcoming slides, in general, IPEX doesn't actually require complex code changes just to get it working initially. Uh, usage can actually be as simple as just several line of code changes. In fact, um, we recommend people get started with basically just ipex.optimize. And how it works is, um, is this, let's say you have a normal training or inference code uh, that is set up in the standard PyTorch manner, um, you know, with a defined model data set, optimizer loss function, et cetera. Um, to that code, you simply just need to import uh, Intel extension for PyTorch and then invoke ipex.optimize. And if you're, the, the difference is if you're running um, a training workload, you just have to set your model to train and send your model as well as the optimizer to IPEX to optimize. And if you're running an inference workload, you just have to set your model to um, eval. And all you need to do is send the, uh, the model itself through IPEX to optimize. And what will happen now is that, so when you first imported IPEX, you already immediately um, certain backend optimizations were applied. And when you invoke IPEX optimize and set your model through it, IPEX will go through the NN uh, dot module and replace certain um, torch operations with their respective IPEX optimiz uh, optimizations. And these two steps alone will yield pretty, pretty solid performance gain. And there are additional steps that you can take to squeeze out more performance, like auto mix precision, quantization, uh, sending it to GraphMo with TorchScript or TorchDynamo. And I will go over uh, these in the upcoming slides. But while I don't want to say they're not necessary because they mo they're, they're certainly very recommended and you're, they'll certainly give you a lot of performance boost. You'll already uh, likely have seen some decent speed up just using IPEX to optimize. And also for uh, GPU, all you would need to do is send the model and data to XPU um, before doing everything else exactly the same. Um, okay, so jumping into the optimizations themselves, uh, we can start with vectorization. So um, we use a simple addition operation as an example, just so z equals uh, a plus b. And all uh, all three of these variables, uh, a, b, and z, are float 32 data types. And when so when performing the calculation, um, three 32-bit long spaces will be cached on registers. Um, so f as I mentioned before, fork from the main PyTorch repo, IPEX adds additional uh, CPU instruction, uh, CPU instruction set architecture support. Um, so, so to, to speed up calculation, um, Intel architecture introduces a, a 128 bit long uh, register with AVX instruction set. Uh, for CPUs equipped with AVX2 instruction sets, the register length got doubled to 256 bits. Um, and then the relatively more recent AVX 512 instruction set works with uh, 512 bit long registers. So as a float 32 data um, is 32 bit long, 128 bit long registers make four sets of data executed in a single clock. And so this methodology is known as um, this is known as vectorization. And the figure uh, here, the figure on the right, um, illustrates acceleration using a uh, 256 bit long register. And you can see um, that vectorization technique speeds up performance uh, by eight it would speed up performance of these operations by eight times in this case. And by default, IPEX actually dispatches do kernels with the maximum ISA level support, that's instruction set architecture level support on the underlying CPU hardware. And you can actually, you can override um, this ISA level, but as a user, as a developer, you likely um, just want to keep the, with the default highest level of support, just if you're, if your goal is to maximize performance. Um, so the vectorization just introduced uh, is a method to optimize a single calculation. Similarly, uh, we can also improve the performance of calculations at a 
um, higher level through thread parallelization. So as shown in this figure, um, an operation that consists of three parts uh, with each part um, containing several operators. Uh, if we were to use uh, the traditional serial method as in one after another um, to perform operators, we must uh, wait for the end of the previous operator before we can enter the next operator. But if we um, if the operators are independent and have no correlation to one another, we can um, actually consider these oper um, we can consider operating these operators at the same time. As, um, and as shown in the figure, uh, the ABC operators in let's in parallel task one have no dependency, so we can perform parallel calculations on them in order to save calculation time. And similarly, in uh, parallel task two and three. Uh, their respective operators can also be uh, parallelized. So in PyTorch, um, GNU's OpenMP library is used by default to provide uh, parallel optimization. But uh, with IPEX, we can also switch to the um, Intel OpenMP implementation by setting uh, environment variable LD underscore preload. And in some cases, the performance using uh, the Intel OpenMP can actually be better. So as I mentioned before, um, the way data is stored in memory is also one of the factors that affects performance. At present, this um, concept is more common uh, for image applications. So let's say if we have a two by two, uh, just for simplicity, a two by two um, RGB image, then we have a total of uh, 12 pixel data. So that's two by two by three, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in the spatial domain uh, and the color domain. Traditionally, um, if, and CHW, which is number channel height width, is used to store uh, the data. We first store the pixel value in the spatial domain and then in the color domain. That's to say that um, we would first store four pixels of red and then four pixels of green and then uh, finally four pixels of blue as this figure depicts. Um, this is the default storage method in PyTorch, which is represented by uh, the torch.contiguous format. Uh, however, it, um, for N, HWC, which is channels last, another storage method on uh, Intel hardware architecture. Um, this storage is actually more optimized in terms of performance. Channels last is um, basically uh, the pixel value on the pre-stored color gamut. Um, for example, uh, for a two by two image, uh, let's say the same two by two image we we're talking about before, you'd first store the red, green, and blue pixel values. Um, in the upper left corner, and then you'd store the red, green, blue pixel values in the upper right corner, and then um, the left corner, uh, the lower left corner, and then um, finally the lower right corner. So this channel's last um, storage usually performs better on uh, Intel platforms, and we're working with Meta to merge um, the optimizations for channels last, um, which is represented by uh, torch.channels last in PyTorch. And when using it, you, we only need to use PyTorch's two function um, on the model object and data um, and set the memory format to uh, channels, to torch.channels last. But starting with IPEX 1.13, um, channels last is actually uh, the default memory storage in IPEX. And uh, so you wouldn't have to go through sending your data to uh, memory format torch.channels last. And this optimization actually works in both the CPU and GPU. Um, another optimization is usage of low uh, precision data types. Recently, more and more applications use low precision data types. Um, Intel provides a uh, low precision data type called bflow16. And compared with uh, traditional single precision flow32, bflow16 um, has only half the bit width which is 16 bits compared to 32. Um, and in order to maintain the same data representation range as float 32, bflow 16 uses the uh, same eight bit exponent length as float 32. Um, and then the mantissa, which is the number afterwards, uh, is reduced from 20, the remaining 23 bits to just seven bits. And um, although a certain precision is lost, the precision is pretty close to float 32. Um, and the goal is to maintain this precision uh, as much as as much as possible. And to apply this optimization, um, all you would have to do is you'd simply invoke torch.cpu.amp.autocast before running your model. And for GPU, 
you just need to replace um, CPU with XPU. So it'd be torch.xpu.amp.autocast. Um, to give you a bit more uh, a bit more practical example, uh, the API related to Dflow 16 is actually relatively simple to use, again, relative to how you would normally uh, set up a PyTorch model um, or Py PyTorch inference script. So like the general uh, PyTorch script, you first need to um, design a model. And so for this example, uh, we'll design a very simple uh, network that we call simple net. Uh, and then you write, you, know, you write your code for inference how you normally would by uh, first instantiating the defined model um, to an object, and then you can set it to inference mode using the dot eval function. Uh, and then you, you would define your input data X. And if you wanted to use single precision floating point operation as FP32, you only need to input the input data X into the model object. You don't have to make any changes. This is the default operation. And as I showed you in the previous slide for Bflow 16, if you wanted to use a lower precision data type, the only code that you would need to add is um, with torch.cpu or xpu.amp.autocast, uh, as I had mentioned before. And uh, if model reasoning is performed sort of in this scope using the with torch dot whatever amp autocast, um, IPEX will automatically will IPEX will automatically handle uh, the data type conversion for you. So that's all you'd have to do in order to make use of this lower precision data type. Uh, on the other hand, another important uh, member of low precision data is, is int8. Compared to uh, bflow16 that we just introduced, int8 further reduces the amount of memory access and usage by half. And uh, the purpose of model quantization is to map the high precision data type of FP32 to the low precision data type int8 um, in order to ensure that the time required for operation is greatly reduced uh, under the premise that um, overall accuracy will not be greatly lost. Then as such, uh, this, is, this is considered to be an approximation method and certain methods will um, actually include um, accuracy aware tuning. But generally speaking, um, int A quantization is as it stands mainly applicable to problems with some degree of error tolerance. So if it needs to be perfectly as exact to the FP32 model, maybe not the best choice, but if there's some degree of error tolerance and you want your model to run faster, quantization with int 8 is a great um, option for you. And since the, uh, the second generation of Intel Xeon scalable processors, we uh, included the instruction set VNNI spe uh, specifically used to accelerate in A operations. Before this, um, in A operations needed to use three instructions um, in series, and the calculation efficiency because of this was relatively low. After we introduced uh, the VNNI instruction set, um, the same int 8 calculation only needed uh, one instruction to complete. So theoretically, it would bring um, a decent uh, performance improvement. And of course, um, in practice, there are uh, many other operations uh, in an end-to-end -end deep learning or a machine learning workload, but it, this alone should bring about a very solid amount of performance boost. Uh, in the latest uh, hardware, we introduced the AMX instruction set, uh, which, will for, which we will uh, further discuss later briefly. Um, that also uh, brings more performance boost to int8. Um, so to apply uh, optimization, compared with the relatively cumbersome quantization steps in PyTorch, uh, IPEX provides an easy to use API to calibrate and convert um, the model. So in general, uh, we, you just simply need to import IPEX as well as uh, compare, uh, as well as not uh, prepare and convert from the IPEX quantization module. Uh, then you just have to instantiate a config object using either torch.ao.quantization.qconfig from standard torch, or you can use the static or dynamic default configuration from ipex.quantization. And um, then, you can, then you prepare the model for quantization. For static quantization, you have an additional step in which you need to calibrate against a data set. You don't have to do this for uh, dynamic quantization. But after this step, uh, then you use convert to convert your FP32 model to int8 
and now you can save this. Um, now you can save this model and use it for faster, uh, faster performance with a smaller footprint. Um, in addition to this, we uh, while the previous static and dynamic quantizations use um, high torch quantization in the back end, we've also recently introduced an experimental uh, int eight quantization uh, auto tuning recipe. And in the back end of this, uh, the model will invoke the um, or IPEX will invoke the uh, Intel neural compressor or INC as we call it, um, which is our open source library of popular model compression techniques optimized uh, for Intel hardware. And the setup is um, is similar, but instead uh, this uses ipex.quantization.autotune. And including, uh, if you see here, if you were, uh, since we're including the data and an eval function, this will allow us to tune the model uh, based on some accuracy criterion. So in other words, this introduces an accuracy aware uh, awareness step when tuning the model. Um, and then the tuned model can then be converted uh, to int eight as normal and saved in, and applied with faster performance in a smaller footprint. Um, you can also perform uh, quantization on GPUs, on Intel GPUs, quantization usage um, follows PyTorch default quantization APIs. Uh, you call torch.quantization.quantwrapper um, set the model to inference, define a config, uh, uh, config with torch.quantization.qconfig, um, prepare the model, calibrate it, then convert it. And uh, the main difference here is that uh, you must send your model and the input calibration data to XPU um, before you use it. And then it'll send it to the, uh, to the GPU. Um, so those were a lot of our optimi operation uh, optimizations. We also have some a set of graph optimizations that I mentioned before. Um, compared to eager mode, uh, graph mode in PyTorch uh, normally yields better performance, and IPEX provides further optimizations in graph mode, uh, which is why we generally recommend users use Torch scripts for inferencing. Uh, and to further optimize Torch script performance, one method that IPEX introduces is operator fusion. Operator fusion is um, basically an optimization method that combines multiple operations into one. Uh, taking the picture on the left as an example, this operation includes two parts. So the first part is a multiplication operation of A and B. And then the second is an addition of C um, and the result of that multiplication. Uh, this operation uh, is shown in the upper right figure in code, uh, the multiplication and addition operations each consist of a loop. This introduces uh, this introduces um, additional memory access related overhead between the multiplication and addition operations. Um, these additional overheads can actually be avoided by directly uh, performing related addition operations on the results of the multiplication operations, uh, as shown on the lower right. Um, this method um, is operator fusion, and the purpose is to reduce the unnecessary um, overhead created uh, by memory um, access, overhead related to memory access. And by default, this operator fusion is actually enabled. It happens in the back end when you use IPEX. But if you wanted to, for whatever reason, you can actually turn it off using IPEX.enable. Uh, one DNN fusion, uh, though obviously it's not recommended if your goal is to maximize performance. Um, and we usually perform operator fusion uh, by means of pattern matching. Here are some commonly used uh, combination of operators, which we'll identify by scanning um, the entire model structure and replacing them with um, the new fused uh, operator. Uh, these are one of those, again, these are one of those sort of backend optimizations. You don't actually have to do anything. IPEX will do it on its own. Um, as I mentioned before, constant folding is another uh, similar optimization. So constant folding means that uh, the combination of two operators is mathematically equivalent to just one of them. Uh, for example, um, in the two operators shown in the figure, the upper part is convolution and the lower part is uh, addition or multiplication. Uh, by, you know, formula, by deriving the formula, you see that the combination of convolution and addition, subtraction, multiplication, um, 
and division operations is actually equivalent to another convolution. And so we can replace the combination um, with a new convolution instead. And a similar combination um, also performs batch norm operations after a convolution. And again, something this is again something that uh, happens in the back end and it gets abstracted out uh, from the developer perspective. So another thing that when you call IPEX, you import IPEX or call IPEX.optimize, another thing that already gets done for you. Um, now moving on to runtime optimizations. Uh, traditionally uh, in the Linux system, we can use uh, the NUMA cattle command or function uh, to bind processes and uh, their affiliated threads on multiple specified NUMA nodes or physical cores. Um, in this way, the system resources required by these operations can be limited um, to that specified NUMA node or physical core. And this will reduce the additional overhead that gets caused by uh, remote access to system resources. And usually such an operation will uh, bring performance improvement, but, but the disadvantage is that um, the binding of system resources is something that's usually determined um, when the program is running and cannot be changed during operation. In order to uh, make the use of system resources binding more flexible, we uh, propose a runtime extension in IPEX, excuse me, which is still experimental. Um, and uh, this function can flexibly adjust the binding of system resources according to tasks at runtime. And we, and you know, along with this, we provide different levels of API functions so that users can uh, use this function simply and quickly and, and also integrate uh, this function into their own code more flexibly. Again, to squeeze out more performance. Um, so thread affinity API allows you to limit the operation to a, a specified CPU pool. So such as um, one, two, three, or four in this example. Um, and then the async task API lets you use the task class um, IPEX's runtime, cla uh, runtime class to define task objects to be executed um, asynchronously. So in the part on the left, um, we can limit the operation to a specified CPU pool through uh, this the pin scope in the runtime um, in IPEX. And alternatively, on the right, we can also use the task class in IPEX to define several task objects. Uh, these task objects perform uh, asynchronous op uh, operations. Uh, and then we could use their get functions to wait. The get function basically will block uh, program execution until the task function returns. The uh, lower figure uh, uh, here on the right is a schematic diagram. Um, we can manually divide the data that needs to be inferred and then pass the respective parts to uh, the created task objects and then capture the, uh, the return value of the inference by calling the get function. And then each task uh, will run on its own designated physical core. And um, in addition, because they're in the same process, each task object um, can access the same model object uh, to save memory usage and to uh, reduce memory access. Uh, and multi-streaming uh, is another runtime extension optimization the multi-stream module class can be used instead to perform the manual steps described on the previous slide. Uh, the functions that we introduced on the previous slide, I, I recognize can be relatively cumbersome, um, but it is convenient for you to integrate uh, into your own uh, implementation logic as needed. But we also provide um, simple and easy to use uh, API, which only needs to use the multi-stream module class to automatically uh, complete the manual operations that I had described on the previous slide. Uh, so basically how it works is um, the incoming large batch uh, size data will be automatically divided um, into several parts in this class and then uh, input into their respective task. And after all task operations are complete, the um, output values then get combined uh, and returned to the user. So again, this is just another thing that gets automated, uh, automating out and abstracting out the steps that we were manually setting in the previous slide. Um, and the benefit of use of the multi-stream module is uh, of course that it can reduce data access between cores as we illustrate in this figure uh, before using these functions, 
uh, because there is no resource binding, computing and data may dis be distributed on different cores, which, which will bring additional computing overhead, such as uh, data synchronization. But after using this function, all calculations and data will be performed on the specified core, which reduces the extra time caused by access between cores. It's a little bit more streamlined, basically. Um, and now you could probably tell, or as you have probably guessed, um, there are several factors that influence performance. And you know, I, and I apologize uh, for sort of throwing the kitchen sink at you. However, setting the configuration options properly uh, should contribute to uh, to a performance boost. But of course, the problem is that there's no unified um, configuration that's optimal to everybody's different hardware. Users will you know, generally need to try different combinations by themselves. So that motivated us to um, provide uh, this launcher script to automate, or at least to help automate these configuration settings uh, in order to you know, free the user from this sort of work so they can get back to developing or just playing around with PyTorch and creating cool uh, tools. Uh, and these configurations are mainly around the um, OpenMP library, uh, memory allocator, and number of instances and in general, the, uh, the launch script is invoked by just calling IPEX run. Uh, this is a terminal command, so you'd call IPEX run, and we have a, a few knobs that you can set or not set if you don't want to, but we have um, documentation for how to run this, and then you would run your, and then you would call your script, and it'll run based on the sort of specified knobs, or it'll automate some of the steps for you. We actually also include um, an auto IPEX flag that will actually, um, we call this a codeless optimization. And basically it'll enable um, IPEX, FB32 or BFLOW16 based on how you set it, um, optimizers in graph mode without actually needing to change any of the Python script. So the launcher script is just something that we, tr we are providing to try to minimize how much you actually have to go in and tweak yourself. Just to, again, make your lives easier, hopefully. Um, so since most of the runtime extensions were related to uh, CPU hardware, it's not applicable to GPU. And while we don't currently have a launch script equivalent or exact one-to-one -one runtime extension APIs, on GPU, you can um, set different environment variables to configure runtime settings and mainly uh, mainly, this is useful for debugging, you know, for example, setting IPEX verbose to print out the one DNN verbose, see what's going on, um, setting IPEX tile as device, you know, things along that line. And um, so now that uh, I've talked about IPEX and some of the optimizations that we incorporated and how to apply them, I just wanted to briefly um, switch gears to the latest hardware. Now, this isn't never meant to be a you know, a sales pitch or a hardware announcement. Um, but earlier this year, we released the fourth gen uh, Intel Xeon scalable processor. And the reason why I'm even bringing this up is because, you know, as you know, as I've been saying, our optimizations closely follow our hardware uh, with the goal being to squeeze out as much performance as possible. And the fourth gen Xeon scalable processor is actually built, I don't know if entirely, but it's built heavily with AI workload in mind. Um, and to that end, this new processor includes a new instruction set that's been um, specifically designed to accelerate matrix operations, which you know is very um, common in deep learning. It's called the Intel Advanced Matrix Extension or AMX. And I did actually mention, uh, I hinted at this a little bit earlier when I was mentioning um, the AVX512, the NNI, AVX2, et cetera. But I just kind of wanted to showcase it uh, front and center since it is new in a lot of our ongoing optimization efforts will be revolved around squeezing performance um, from from here. Uh, and I'm not going to go too into the weeds because I recognize uh, in the interest of time, but basically uh, it consists of two main pieces. The first pieces are tiles, which are just 2D register files. And the second piece is uh, T T M U L T M U L, um, which stands for uh, the tile matrix multiplication instructions, uh, which is matrix multiplication on these tiles. So it's pretty much load uh, the matrices in 2D registers uh, and then apply those matrices um, and then multiply those matrices. You know, it's kind of exactly how you'd expect. And what this boils down to is being able to store uh, bigger chunks of data in each core and then uh, being able to compute on larger matrices in a single operation. Now, I don't know if we'll have time to go over any sort of tutorials, but I wanted to uh, show some of these, or at least 
put up some links to some tutorials that I thought were very interesting. I was going to go over the, um, if we had time, it doesn't look like we will. Um, I was going to go over the this one, the second one, the inference optimization on uh, AMX BF16, you know, which is why I showed those slides. I wanted to show you how um, you can get some performance boost on AMX, especially using BF16 or int8. But this is actually, um, you see this GitHub page here, this one API sources, um, one API samples. As I mentioned before, a lot of our optimizations are built on one API. We actually have a repo that is comprised of a bunch of demos and instructions on how to get started with using not just PyTorch, all of our um, optimized frameworks, but PyTorch as well. Um, and it, it, you know, it's just a repo, there's a readme, there's step-by-step -step instructions. Uh, another sort of thing that I wanted to show was um, this Hugging Face blog, also using the uh, fourth gen Xeon scalable processor, which we codenamed Sapphire Rapids. This was by uh, Julian Simon from Hugging Face, who ran a training script on, um, on some Sapphire Rapids, on some uh, transformer models to show that the performance was actually pretty good. And um, this right here is a uh, tutorial blog post from uh, Ben, uh, where he um, showcased uh, training and inference using uh, IPEX and Sapphire Rapids on satellite images. Um, and again, it's a very, and uh, well, this is just the medium link. I believe it also links to the GitHub repository. If it doesn't, I, we can send you that GitHub repository, but it's a very, um, very comprehensive, very easy to follow tutorial. Regretfully that I don't have the time to go over today, but you know, Ben has given talks about it in the past and you know, we're happy to come back and, and give you a more hands-on tutorial with that if it's of any interest. Um, so that I think I will uh, close out so I can take any questions from the audience just so people have time to interact. Uh, Kevin, could you share these links in the chat? Uh, yeah, sure. Let me, let me stop sharing and let me. Great, thank you. Thank you for mm -hmm. sharing. Yeah, of course. Uh, if you don't have any questions, then I guess we can wind up. <laughs> thank you so much, Kevin, for this wonderful talk. It was really informative. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you for all the participants for uh, attending this uh, meetup. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks, Deborah.